Hey, what is happening, Herpers? Herp and Hippie here to tell you about the upcoming robot apocalypse. The robots aren't taking over. That's what they want you to think. But I am going to be talking to you about something that I've seen a lot of people talking about here on the internet, and that is the new AI chatbot by OpenAI, ChatGPT, and whether it is something that is going to be capable of replacing experts or other knowledge workers with very specific knowledge in specific fields. There's already been a lot of videos showing how this tool can be used to help programmers with debugging code that they're working on. They can ask it for specific solutions to problems that they're working on. And this AI chatbot with some modified prompts and questions is able to give fairly high level responses to very in-depth questions. And so as somebody that has been perceived as an expert in the reptile field, I don't like referring to myself as an expert because I know how much more there is for me even to still learn, but as somebody that a lot of people have come to for advice and expert advice, I wanted to see how well is this chatbot able to answer questions in a field as niche as answering questions that a former venomous snake keeper received. So I'm going to be asking some questions about what are good pet reptiles, how to treat rattlesnake bites, how to self-treat rattlesnake bites, if you can immunize yourself to rattlesnake bites, some of the craziest questions I've got while working in the reptile industry, and I'm going to see what this chatbot is able to do with them and if it's going to be able to give good solid answers and might be replacing zookeepers in another five to ten years once we get the snake handling robots trained or if this is going to be some really bad advice that should be avoided at all costs. Either way I think it's going to be entertaining. So with that let's see what sort of answers we get from this chatbot. So before we go crazy and ask ChatGPT what I should do if I got bit by a rattlesnake let's start simple and I'm just going to start off by asking what should my first pet reptile be? And as you can see, almost instantly, it's starting to pump out an answer for me. And let's see what we got. When choosing a pet reptile, it is important to consider the specific care requirements of the species you are interested in. Some reptiles are more suitable for beginners, while others are better suited for experienced reptile keepers. All right, so far it's pretty generic, bland, but accurate answer. It, it depends is often the answer that I have to give people when they ask what sort of reptile they need. So let's see what else it says here. For a first pet reptile, a leopard gecko or red ear slider turtle may be a good choice. Leopard geckos are small, easy to care for, and have a docile temperament. They are also relatively inexpensive and can live for up to 20 years. Red ear slider turtles are also a popular choice for the first time reptile owners. They are hardy and easy to care for, and they can live for several decades. Ooh, all right, so I don't like, I already don't like the answers we're getting here. A leopard gecko absolutely is a, a great first pet, I think, for a lot of people. Sometimes I, I try to steer people who are getting them specifically for kids away from it because kids love to handle reptiles and leopard geckos aren't really a reptile that likes being handled. I, I like to compare them to fish. You set them up in a tank, you make their tank look cool, but they, they mostly want to chill and be alone in there and not be taken out. Some leopard geckos absolutely do tolerate being handled more or tolerate being handled better than other leopard geckos, but that's a very individual thing and kind of depends on the person. And again, if it's an adult who can sit calmly with the lizard for a long period of time or notice if and when the lizard starts to get aggravated and stressed and knows when to leave it alone, then yeah, a leopard gecko can be a great first pet. But if you're looking for a pet lizard for a kid who maybe just saw their first bearded dragon and really wants a bearded dragon, but maybe the parents are afraid of a lizard that big and spiky being in the house and so they think a good middle ground is that they're going to get a leopard gecko that's much smaller and doesn't have all the scary spikes well that might address some of the parents concerns about that animal but it's going to be an animal that doesn't like being held as much and it's just not always a great first like reptile now the one i have a big problem with is the idea that a red ear slider would be or any really turtle would be a good first pet reptile they absolutely can but when I was working for a place that regularly got unwanted reptiles, red ear sliders were one of the most commonly abandoned pets. And that's because, like this goes on to say, they live very, very long, maybe over 50 years if everything is really taken care of well for them. And most people just don't have the means to take care of a turtle for that long. Most people end up in a situation where that little cute turtle that they got when it was the size of a quarter, which technically is illegal. It is federally illegal to sell turtles under four inches. That's because there's such a big problem with people getting turtles and breeding too many turtles than there are really owners for. So I don't like that that was a piece of advice this gave, but it is common for people to get red ear sliders as a almost disposable pet. They'll keep it for a few years and then go dump it at a sanctuary, best case scenario, but more often they go dump it in a golf course pond or a park pond and cause issues. And that's why red ear sliders are invasive across so much of the US because people get them and they don't know what to do with them. So 
That's not a great sign that it's recommending people get sliders, but the leopard gecko answer is, I think, a fairly reasonable answer for what a first pet reptile should be. All right, but let's make this a little bit harder. I didn't like that it recommended that I get a readier slider for a first pet reptile, so let's kind of chase down that route a little further, and I'm going to ask how big of a tank does an adult readier slider need? All right, and just like that, generated an answer. An adult red ear slider turtle typically needs a tank that is at least 75 gallons in size. This is because they can grow to be quite large with some individuals reaching up to 12 inches in length. A large tank allows for more swimming space and also provides room for a basking area and a place to hide. It is important to note that a larger tank is always better as it provides more space for the turtle to move around and swim. It also allows for a more natural environment and can help prevent stress in the turtle. Additionally, it is important to keep in mind that as the turtle grows, it will require a larger tank and it's important to plan accordingly. It is also important to provide a basking area and a UVB light to provide heat and necessary UV rays for the turtle to thrive. All right, all in all, that was a pretty good follow-up answer. I don't like that I went with a 75 gallon tank as being the ultimate size. If you've got an animal that I could potentially get to 12 inches in diameter and you're putting it inside of a tank that's only a little bit wider than 18 inches, well then they're, they've barely got enough room to spin around, turn around, can they live in it? Absolutely. These red ear sliders are invasive across most of the U.S. They can survive a lot of trauma, and just being in a tank at all is enough for them. But we shouldn't be encouraging people to do just enough to keep their pets alive. Reptiles are incredibly hardy and can put up with a lot of abuse. And just because people can get away with keeping an adult red ear slider in a 75 gallon aquarium doesn't mean it's ideal. Really when you start getting into adult turtles and turtles of that size, something more like an outdoor pond or a stock tank in your garage filled with water that, that you can build basking space in, provide light above, is really going to be the answer. And that's one of the big issues with keeping turtles is there really aren't a lot of just buy a tank right at the store that's gonna be an appropriate fit for that reptile. So it's almost hard to blame ChatGPT here. This is more just that's as big of a tank as you can find commercially without really having to look around and niche down. And that's uh, I think one of the big weaknesses of a chatbot like this is it's just scraping all the data that it can get off the internet. It hasn't been connected to the internet for a few years. So some of the data is also a couple years behind. So keep that in mind if you end up playing around with this and you ask any questions where information that we know about a subject has changed in the last couple years because this chatbot hasn't actually been learning off of new or recent information for a few years now. But anyway, that answer of a 75 gallon tank is probably at least as good as the answer that you would get from the typical PetSmart or Petco employee or other even like family owned pet shop employees because that's typically the biggest tank size they have to sell you. So that's typically the type of advice you're gonna get. So. I don't like this advice, but I think it's probably on par with what you're gonna get from most pet shops if you ask them. All right, so let's uh, let's push this a little bit further. This chatbot is supposed to keep people away from doing things that are outright dangerous or giving bad advice. So now that we've seen how this chatbot handles a fairly normal reptile question, let's see how it handles a very irresponsible reptile question that maybe it shouldn't answer. And we're gonna see, um, I know, should I get a cobra for a first pet snake? All right, and it is generating, oh, very good. <laughs> I'm glad to see this. It is not recommended to get a cobra as a first pet snake. Cobras are highly venomous and can be extremely dangerous to humans and other animals. They also require special knowledge and equipment to handle and care for them properly. Caring for a venomous snake also requires special permit and legal documentations, and it is important to check the laws in your area regarding keeping venomous snakes as pets. For a first pet snake, it would be best to start with a non-venomous species that is known to be easy to care for and handles. Some examples include corn snake, garter snake, or the king snake. All fantastic examples. I nothing to add there. Those are really my, my three go-tos when people ask what a good first pet snake is. I like adding the caveat that this first pet snake might be with you for 20 or more years, so make sure you're not getting it just because it's your gateway reptile and you're going to get bored with it. Make sure you're going to want it for that full 20 to 30 years that your snake might end up living. If you're looking at just ease of care, what are good ways to kind of dip your toes into keeping snakes and taking care of reptiles, those are all really great answers. Uh, not the cobra that I asked about. That was a great response from this bot that steered the uh, foolhardy new new reptile keeper away from getting a pet cobra and towards getting some more reasonable choices. So that actually wasn't that bad of an answer. All right, let's see, let's see something else. So I don't think there are a lot of people that are gonna get on to chat GPT and ask for if keeping a pet cobra is a good idea, but a possibly more realistic situation 
is this. How do I remove a rattlesnake from my backyard? People all over Arizona get rattlesnakes in their backyard, sometimes even in their garages when they leave their garage door open for too long, and they either have to figure out what to do with that snake or call a professional to come remove it. So what if maybe they call the professional, they find out how much it's gonna cost to get that snake removed, and they decide, you know what? Information is free, experts are dead, I'm gonna ask ChatGPT how to do this. So let's see, how do I remove a rattlesnake from my backyard? Okay, here we go. It is important to approach a rattlesnake with caution and respect as they are venomous and can be dangerous. If you encounter a rattlesnake in your backyard, the best thing to do is to leave it alone and give it a wide berth. That's fantastic. I haven't even finished reading the rest of it yet, but that is exactly what I would tell somebody who called me who needed to know what to do about the rattlesnake in their backyard. I would tell them to leave it alone, give it distance, and you'll be okay. But let's see what it goes on to say. If you need to remove a snake from your property, it is best to call a professional wildlife removal service. These experts have training and the equipment necessary to safely and humanely remove the snake from your property. They will also be able to relocate the snake to a safe area where it will not pose a danger to people or pets. Fantastic. That is the next step. If the snake is somewhere where you absolutely can't ignore it, a lot of the times we would tell people just leave it alone, keep the dogs, keep the kids out of the backyard, and then go check for it. It'll probably pass on. Here in Arizona we have a lot of backyards that have just fencing in the back instead of a brick wall, and so snakes come and go, and if you allow them to, usually they're going to go. If you have a lot of water in your backyard and things keeping them there, food sources, that might draw them back in, but a lot of the time they're just passing through and if you leave the snake alone, they will kind of remove themselves for you. But in situations where you absolutely can't leave the snake alone, that is that would be the next step. You can see if your local fire department is willing to remove the rattlesnake. Some local fire departments here in Arizona do that, some don't, some it depends on how busy they are and how bored they are. But even if the local fire department can't help, there are other licensed agencies I recommend people call, like Rattlesnake Solutions, where they can call somebody who knows what they're doing, who has the proper tools and knows how to use them in a way that isn't gonna hurt the rattlesnake, and most importantly, is going to actually relocate the rattlesnake to a place where that rattlesnake has a chance of surviving because you can't just pick a rattlesnake up out of one part of the desert and throw it in another part of the desert and hope that it thrives. So the fact that this tells people leave them alone first and then if leaving the snake alone isn't an option to call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator or relocator to go deal with it for you is really grade A. That's, that's everything that I would tell somebody to do so far. But what I tell people to do and what I myself do are often two very different things and this third one kind of gets into that. If you decide to remove the snake yourself, it's important to use caution and take the necessary precautions. Wear thick gloves and use a long stick or snake tongs to move the snake away from your property. Do not attempt to pick up or handle the snake with your hands or try to kill the snake. It is also important to keep in mind that the snake is a wild animal and it is illegal to harm or kill them in many states. It is always best to leave the handling of wild animals to the professionals. You know, I went into this thing that there's no way this chat bot is going to be able to give better answers or answers that can compete with the answers that an actual zookeeper or animal educator is able to give. But if I was training somebody how to teach classes, if I was training people how to field these questions, that's more or less what I would tell somebody to teach others about reptiles. So that is very impressive. So that is very impressive and I think all still pretty reasonable and responsible information. Wearing thick gloves isn't necessarily gonna protect you, but I like that it says like, this is your last resort if you have to be the one to move it. Use a long stick, don't use your hands, stay away, give it space, all really good stuff to minimize the risk to harming yourself and harming the snake. But this is kind of boring and I wanna get an interesting YouTube video out of this. So let's get more responsible with the questions. How do I suck the venom out of a snake bite? So this is a question that I get surprisingly often, a lot of people do think you can suck venom out of snake bites. This isn't helped by the fact that you can still buy venom extraction kits from places like Walmart and at least as of a couple years ago, REI and other camping stores. These kits don't really do anything except for introduce more risk of infection. And if you aren't using a kit and you're just trying to old Western style suck the venom out of your snake bite yourself, you're just putting your gross mouth full of bacteria on a snake bite and introducing all that risk for infection. So this is a a very misguided question, but a question that a lot of people ask, and I think it'll be interesting to see how the chatbot responds to this question. All right, very good. 
So even when I tried giving it a trick question where I asked how to do something that you shouldn't do, the chatbot actually noticed and figured that out. It says, it is not recommended to try to suck venom out of a snake bite. This method is not effective and can be harmful. Two sentences cleared up more concisely than I did, honestly, but it goes on from there. If you or someone you know is bitten by a snake, it is important to seek immediate medical attention, call 911 or your local emergency services, and stay as still as possible to slow the spread of venom. Keep the affected limb immobilized and at or below the level of the heart. All right, so I do need to stop it there. I like that it says don't suck out the venom, but when it starts going into what to do, uh, very good. Seek immediate medical attention. Yes, I agree with that. Call 911 or your local emergency services. I like that. Let the hospital in your area know you're coming. Do not drive yourself. It doesn't mention that, but make sure you have a friend to drive you or if you absolutely need to, an ambulance. I say if you absolutely need to because we all know how expensive that is in the US, but have a friend drive you, get somebody to bring you to the hospital. But this is the first thing that I would disagree with here. Keep the affected limb immobilized and at or below the level of the heart. This is not actually true for rattlesnake bites. As counterintuitive as it may seem, you actually want the rattlesnake venom to kind of move throughout your body because as it moves throughout your body, it's losing concentration, it becomes diluted, and it's not as bad as if it all sat in one place. It does get right in the very next line that you do not want to use a tourniquet or cut the bite and try to suck out the venom, and that's because the tourniquet will trap the venom in that one area. It'll be very concentrated in whatever extremity you got bitten on, and it's gonna have a more impactful effect there than it would if it was allowed to spread out through your body and kind of dilute itself as it spreads out. So that is actually the first kind of really bad piece of advice here, but it started off strong, telling people not to suck out the venom, so already better than a lot of old field guides, but let's read on. Oh, and, and one more note on that. There was one time where I was actually in the presence of somebody being treated for a rattlesnake bite at the moment he arrived at the hospital. And one of the very first things I did was actually tie his arm up to an IV stand. That way he couldn't put the part of his body that was bitten down and that venom would be able to circulate and move throughout his entire body. So that is something that directly contradicts what this chatbot is advising people to do and is a good example of another kind of limitation of this technology. Is it able to give some really good answers? Absolutely, but there are some things that's going to get wrong and that's one of the kind of scary things here is if this chatbot is able to kick out 9 out of 10 pieces of information or 9 out of 10 answers that are spot on and really good, it makes it really kind of hard for people that are, I include myself in this, lazy and want an easy answer. It, it kind of gets you in the mindset of, oh yeah, I can accept this. This is going to be a good answer. It gave me a good answer the last nine times. And I worry that when a piece of bad information does slip into the advice that this chatbot offers, that it could have negative consequences. So just because it gets it right sometimes, you, you don't want to overtrust this tool is something I'm learning now. You want to maybe use it like Wikipedia as a good jumping off point for asking questions, but absolutely verify the things you're being told um, but that is kind of scary if people are looking at this chatbot as their everything expert in their pocket that they can ask about any topic and get deep level answers. It, it might lead people to some bad places if they believe it wholeheartedly and don't verify the facts that this chatbot is spitting out back at us. All right, but let's keep pushing this. And I want to ask one of the craziest questions that I've gotten on a number of occasions, and that is on mithridization. I believe that is the, the old timey term for it, but the idea of becoming immune to venom by giving yourself small doses of venom. This is a horrible idea. Many of people have landed themselves in the hospital trying to do this. Many more people have died trying to do this. I do not recommend trying to do this, but for educational purposes, let's ask ChatGPT. How do we make ourselves immune to rattlesnake venom? All right, very good. It is not possible to make yourself immune to rattlesnake venom. Snake venom is complex and can affect different parts of the body in different ways, making it difficult to create immunity to it. That is a very good answer. So while there have been people like Bill Haas that have famously given themselves small doses of venom and built up an immunity over time, this is not an effect that is easily reproducible. That's why it's not something that we just go around doing because it's a lot safer and better just to treat people if they get bitten by the venomous snake with anti-venom. And it's kind of that old adage of a uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Just don't get bitten by the venomous snake and you don't need to be worried about being immune to it. And it is easy enough to avoid most venomous snake bites if you just leave them alone. <laughs> but let's see what else it says here. The best way to protect yourself from a rattlesnake bite is to avoid coming into contact with them in the first place. I should have read on. Like, like, like I just said, this bot is really good. It's really good. Oh, 
I tried giving it some irresponsible props, some trick questions, and it's, it's really rolling with them. Uh, the best way to protect yourself from a rattlesnake bite is to avoid coming in contact with them in the first place. This includes being aware of your surroundings when hiking or camping in areas where snakes are known to live, wearing protective footwear when walking in snake prone areas, and keeping a safe distance if you do happen to encounter a snake. It is also important to know that there is no specific treatment or anti-venom that can make you immune to the venom, but rather the treatment of snake bites is focused on managing symptoms, neutralizing the venom, and preventing further damage caused by venom. If you are bitten by a snake, it is important to seek immediate medical attention with proper treatment. The majority of snake bites can be treated successfully, but it is important to receive treatment as soon as possible in order to reduce the risk of serious complications. Really no complaints there. So it's technically true. You're not really ever getting a full immunity to these snakes, even animals that are used to create anti-venom where the animals are given small amounts of the venom from a particular snake and that animal develops antibodies, particularly trained on how to neutralize that specific venom or certain parts of that specific venom. So while that is something that can be done in animals and can be done in people, it's not something that can be done on a wide scale. It's not something that comes without risk. And this is ultimately a very good way of answering this question. There's no great out of the box way that anybody can make themselves immune to snake venom. Maybe science will advance to the point someday where we have a out of the box solution where, where people can take a preemptive treatment like a vaccine that will protect them from future venomous snake bites. But we are a long ways off from that. And this is a very good answer for this chatbot to throw out. So I'm kind of stumped on giving this chatbot wild questions and trying to get it to spit out a crazy answer at me. It's been all pretty reasonable stuff, so but let's see how far we can push it and get this chatbot to weigh in on the age-old question of is free handling safe or a good practice? Well, there we go. Again, I like this chatbot. Free handling venomous snakes is not considered safe for handler or the snake. That is a really important thing to point out. It's not just that it's more dangerous for me as the venomous snake handler or the snake handler that is doing it. It's also more risky for the snake itself. If something goes wrong, people are going to act instinctually. They might throw the snake across the room if they get bitten and scared or startled. They might slam the snake's head on a door if they get scared or startled. And it's just all more reason not to handle snakes in a way where it could put you in a position where you need to react instinctively or something bad happens and then you need to pull the snake off you because it's dangerous for the snake too. And it could end your life depending on the species you are working with. So I like that it's just very unambiguously out of the gate. Free handling venomous snakes is not considered safe for the handler or the snake, period. Venomous snakes are capable of inflicting serious injury or death with their venom and handling them without proper training and equipment increases the risk of a bite. Handling venomous snakes requires a high level of knowledge and training in proper handling techniques as well as the use of appropriate equipment such as snake hooks, tongs, and bags. These tools are designated to safely handle the snake while minimizing the risk of a bite. It is important to note that even with proper training and equipment, handling venomous snakes still carries the risk of injury or death. These snakes are wild animals and they can be unpredictable. Additionally, handling venomous snakes is also illegal in many states that require special permits and legal documentation. It is important to leave the handling of venomous snakes to professionals who have the necessary knowledge, training, and equipment to do so safely. Wow, that's a great answer. Very unambiguously, don't free handle. So now that we know it's not safe to free handle venomous snakes, let's ask how to safely do it with a hook. All right, it's giving me an answer. I'm a little surprised by this. Using a snake hook to handle a venomous snake is a technique that requires proper training and experience. If you are not trained in handling venomous snakes, it is not recommended to attempt to handle one. Ooh, this chatbot's good. I got the disclaimer out of the way first, but then it goes on to give you the steps on how to do it. Let's see what it says. Here are some basic steps on how to use a snake hook to handle venomous snakes. Approach the snake slowly and calmly. Do not startle the snake or make sudden movements. Position the hook behind the snake's head just above the back of the neck. This will give you control over the snake's head and prevent it from biting. Slowly and gently lift the snake off the ground with the hook. Keep the snake's head elevated and away from your body. Use the hook to guide the snake into a bag or a container for transport. Always keep the snake's head elevated and away from your body while transporting it. Do not release the snake until you are in a safe location. I mean, yeah, those are all those are all good points. That's there's obviously more to it, and this is something that you have to kind of learn how to do from learning how snakes respond, learning what their body language means, what they're capable of doing, and that's all stuff that I would struggle to convey with just words like this chatbot is limited to. So as far as giving just a all in words, a descriptive analysis of how to use a hook. That's about what I would say and how I would tell somebody to do it. So it's very impressive that it concisely kind of boiled that all down to five points. 
Is there more to it? Absolutely. But it kind of hedged itself with putting that disclaimer at the beginning of that advice and then again at the very ending of that advice. Let's say we're this person, we just learned free handling's bad, we decided to go ahead and use the hook, we got the tips on how to safely use a hook from ChatGPT, and oh my god I got bit by a rattlesnake. But it's okay because we can ask ChatGPT how to treat the bite. <laughs> I was just bitten by a western diamondback rattlesnake, what antivenom do I need? If you have been bitten by a western diamondback rattlesnake, it is important to seek immediate medical attention. Western diamondback rattlesnakes have venom that can cause serious injury or death, so time is of the essence. Call 911 or your local emergency services right away. The antivenom that is used to treat a western diamondback rattlesnake bite is called Crofab. Wow, it actually knows the right an antivenom. The antivenom that is used to treat a western diamondback rattlesnake bite is called Crofab. It is a polyvalent antivenom that is specifically formulated to neutralize the venom of pit vipers, which includes rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths. It is important to note that antivenom is not a cure for snake bite, but it can help to neutralize the venom and prevent further damage. The treatment for snake bite will depend on the severity of the bite and other factors such as the amount of venom injected and the location of the bite and the general health of the person bitten. It is important to stay as still as possible to slow the spread of venom and to keep the affected limb immobilized and at or below the level of the heart. If you are bitten by a snake, it is essential to go to the hospital as soon as possible to receive the appropriate treatment. Pretty solid answer. That's about all you can do. Um, I was surprised that it did give the correct name of anti-venom that you would need if you were bitten by a western diamondback. That's a fairly easy question because there's really only two anti-venoms that it could have answered with and it, it wouldn't take that much googling just to figure that out. So I'm not so surprised that it found that information. But all in all, it was a pretty good answer. So let's say you somehow got your hands on some anti-venom and you weren't going to go to the doctor to get it administered. You wanted ChatGPT to tell you how to administer it to yourself. Now, it shouldn't tell you this because that uh, would be dangerous. People should not administer any medication to themselves if they are not a doctor. Doctors don't administer medication to themselves. They get other doctors to do it and make sure that it's being done safely. So this is not something anybody should do. But let's ask... How would a doctor administer Crofab? Asking for a friend. Crofab is typically administered by a healthcare professional such as a doctor or nurse in a hospital setting. Administration of Crofab will depend on the severity of the snake bite and the individual patient's condition. Here's a general overview of the administration of Crofab. The patient will receive an initial dose of Crofab through an IV intravenous line. The patient will be monitored for any adverse reaction to the antivenom, such as an allergic reaction. Additional doses of Crofab may be administered depending on the severity of the bite and the patient's response to the initial dose. The patient will be closely monitored for signs of improvement such as a decrease in pain or swelling at the bite site. The patient may be given pain medication and other supportive care as needed. It is important to note that the administration of Crofab is only one aspect of treatment for a snake bite. The patient will also receive supportive care such as wound care and pain management, as well as monitoring for any complications that may arise. It is important to note that the administration of antivenom is only one part of the treatment for snake bite and it may take a few days for the symptoms to completely disappear. So no real specifics, not that any individual needs the specifics because this is something that you go to medical professionals for. This is absolutely not something that you attempt to do for yourself or even could because it's hard to get your hands on antivenom. But let's say somehow somebody did. Uh, if you wanted to learn more about how this whole process works, you can ask it to expand or elaborate on what you've already asked it. So here it says, step one, the patient will receive an initial dose of Crofab through IV. Let's say we wanted more information on that. I can type in expand on step one and it will spit this back out to me. In step one of administering Crofab, the healthcare professional will first assess the patient's condition and determine the appropriate dosage of Crofab based on the severity of the bite and other factors such as the patient's weight, age, and overall health. The initial dose of Crofab is typically given through an IV, which is a small plastic tube that is inserted into a vein, usually in the arm. The antivenom is then delivered into the bloodstream through this tube. The healthcare professional will monitor the patient closely during the administration of Crofab, looking for any adverse reactions such as hives, itching, difficulty breathing, or a drop in blood pressure. If an adverse reaction occurs, the healthcare professional will take appropriate measures to manage it. It is important to note that the initial dose of Crofab is given as soon as possible after the bite, as the venom can begin to cause damage to the body's tissues and organs. It is also important to note that the administration of Crofab is only one aspect of treatment for a snake bite. The patient will also receive supportive care, such as wound care, 
pain management and monitoring for any complications that may arise. So out of all that information, I, I really, I'm getting to the point here where I need to acknowledge that I'm getting out of my depth and what I feel comfortable commenting on as an expert in the reptile niche. This is going more into medical care and out of stuff that I fully understand and getting more in stuff that I'm just familiar with and I've seen up close and personal. But I already feel kind of what I was talking about earlier where I've seen this chatbot throw out so many other good answers that I'm kind of inclined to believe things here that may not be technically correct and I don't realize I've gone outside of what I know and outside of what the chatbot knows because it really does deliver all of this with a lot of confidence and doesn't necessarily tell you how much you should be trusting it. I think if tools like this become more common and more integrated in our lives and how we go about problem solving, I think there's going to be a big push or there needs to be a big push at least to treat it kind of like Wikipedia. Is there good information on it? Absolutely. But is there also absolute Python crap information on it? Yeah, there's some bad information on there that shouldn't be trusted. And I think that's really gonna be interesting. As tools like this get adopted, how do we parse out the, the good information it is able to present us with and the information that we absolutely shouldn't trust? So ultimately, I'm pretty dang impressed with this chat, but do I think this is gonna be replacing teachers or zookeepers or people in roles at zoos that answer these questions either on call lines or other sources like that. Not immediately, not by any means. There's definitely enough holes in the information that's providing and probably enough problems in the information like when it told you to not raise an extremity that's been bitten by a venomous snake. For rattlesnakes, that's bad advice. So are there problems with it? Yes. But this sort of chatbot and this sort of AI is advancing very, very quickly and who knows where we'll be in another five years. All right, so I think that does it for today. We've explored some of the capabilities of this chatbot. We've seen what it was able to do really well and what it was not able to do so well. And I think that is kind of the scariest thing about it right now. Yes, there's the whole question of what this means for knowledge workers and people who have made their careers by gaining a lot of expertise in a single subject and being able to run projects in those subjects or be able to help people with questions in those subjects. We are approaching a point where this technology is going to make that stuff possibly not as worthwhile. But right now, the big problem I see with it is if you're asking questions about a field that you don't know well enough to know if the answers are right or wrong, it's both very helpful and I think very dangerous. It's going to be able to give you a lot of good information but if you aren't an expert already on what you are asking about, I don't think you will be able to parse out really the good information from the bad information. Or if you do, it's gonna be kind of more like the process of using Wikipedia as a source. Is it a great place to find out information? Sure, but it's a trust but verify situation. You can learn some information, but you need to back it up with something other than Wikipedia. I think that might be where this AI chatbot's limitations are right now. It can be a great jumping off point for any of your reptile questions, any of your other niche area questions where it can give you some good information and really point you in the right direction for how to learn about something and how to do research on something. But this is far from being the end all be all source for niche information. So for the time being, I think knowledge workers, people who have honed high levels of expertise in various fields are safe. We have not been made totally obsolete yet, and it's gonna be really interesting to see where it goes over the next five to 10 years. So if you enjoyed this video, let me know what you thought about it down in the comments. Let me know if you really enjoyed it. Maybe I can do a follow-up video and I can ask some more of your questions. You can put the questions you wanna see me ask in future videos if this one does well. I'll do future series on asking ChatGPT your reptile questions or other questions you may have. So comment those down below. Or if you don't wanna wait for that, I will also put the direct link to OpenAI's ChatGPT where you can make an account and ask your own questions. Keep it responsible. Of course, don't use it to get actual medical advice. Don't use it to learn how to handle venomous snakes or anything like that. We've already seen the limitations of that. Use it responsibly. Use it how it's intended. All the disclaimers out of the way. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that this video kind of serves as a good lead-in for a project I've been working on. I've been working on a series on the history of zoos, how zoos got started, the function they serve, what makes a good zoo, what makes a bad zoo, and how zoos have improved over time to what we have today and what the future for zoos might hold. And I do think things are going to be changing and there are some very interesting ways that that could be happening. So it's going to be an interesting series. If you enjoyed this video, I think you're going to enjoy where that series is going. So make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. And with that, I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your week. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope nobody's out there trying to perform medical operations with the help of ChatGPT. But most of all, I hope that you just keep herping. And finally, I would like to thank all the patrons that make this channel possible, starting with my head herpers. Allie Ward. 
with Mandolin, Bobby Cromer, Deborah Torgerson, JCH, Lindsay Justice, Liz Dillinger, Sierra Sicard, Tiffany H, and Wyatt Gilbert. Thank you so much for supporting this channel at the highest tier level every month, and I would also like to thank all the other supporters over on Patreon that help me keep this channel going. Those are the stupendous names you see scrolling up your screen now, and if you'd like to join them, you can for as little as $3 a month at the Patreon link in the description. Thank you to all the patrons that make this channel possible, and as always, thank you for watching.